Hey guys, good morning, good afternoon, whenever it is you happen to be watching our video. Uh, today we're going to be recording the next session of our conversations with pastors. Today I'm honored and thrilled to have Dr. Ted Elmore with us. Uh, Brother Ted is uh, one of the members of our network. He also is the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church down in Harlingen, Texas, and uh, been a dear friend for many, many years. Matter of fact, the truth is when the Lord first laid this ministry on my heart, uh, one of the folks that my wife and I drove up to Dallas and spent the time with just trying to to, uh, to, to seek counsel, seek good, solid wisdom and, and guidance was a uh, uh, brother Ted and Miss Cheryl. And so uh, he's a dear brother, dear friend, and uh, uh, I'm excited for him to be with us today. But one of the things that, that we, we talked about, and I'll let him explain some more of this, is that uh, Brother Ted is now at a church there in Harlingen. And um, when we talked, he said something that piqued my interest. And so I, that's what I want him to talk about today. The idea of a church transformation rather than in, in our church culture today, a church replant, a church revitalization, whatever name you want to give it. Um, but just the idea of walking into a, an older established church. Uh, and, and I don't know the statistics on Calvary, but that's a church that, that was in need of, of a fresh vision, a fresh goal, uh, those kinds of things and, and what that looks like for him. So brother Ted, thanks for being here this morning. Um, today, as we walk through this, I would like for you to just share a little bit about you, about your background, uh, those kinds of things, and then we'll kind of jump into to what we want to do. But thanks for being here with us today. Oh, Dennis, thank you for having me. It is a joy, and my goodness, Cheryl and I cherish you and your sweet family, and uh, thank God for the privilege of knowing you. I, I'm proud of what I see you doing. I think it's a tremendous need, and I'm honored to be a part of this. I, um, I give you a little background on my story. I grew up in East Tennessee. Uh, traditional Baptist, made the obligatory confession of faith at about 11 years of age, uh, deeply convicted of sin. But in those days and in our little churches, and they were all small churches, mostly rural churches, uh, it was in a revival meeting and our pastor was preaching that revival meeting. And so you always went to the altar and knelt at a mourner's bench and prayed. Well, even though I grew up in a Christian home with good moral and biblical teaching, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I got down on my knees and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And finally, I got so embarrassed. I stood up and I did the obligatory testimony. Well, I want to thank the Lord for saving me because you, you say something. And uh, about a year later, and I was baptized and uh, about a year later, I, I began to sense God doing something in my heart. And I didn't know what that was. And my mother said, well, I believe God's calling you to preach. And my father said, the last thing we need is another mama called preacher. And so I, I think dad was more right than mom. I think God was dealing with me at the point of, of salvation. And I just didn't recognize it because I didn't really understand what I was doing at 11 and uh, I didn't want to preach because I wanted to play baseball. I mean, somebody's got to take Mickey Mantle's place, right? Why not me? And uh, uh, it, anyway, but I was never that good. And I, I could, I was a great fielder, but a poor hitter. And so uh, I played high school ball and went on to college and things like that. Moved to Dayton, Ohio, because East Tennessee, what you read about Appalachian poverty is true. And we grew up poor. My parents moved when I graduated from high school in order to get a better job. And, and so they did. And for the first time in our life, bought a home. Now, I was ready to move out and move out on my own. And I had some wild years that I'm very ashamed of and I put under the blood of Jesus. But I met a young lady by the name of Cheryl. Uh, she was of the Roman Catholic faith. And my parents were just scared to death. You know, here you are, uh, gosh, you're going to marry a Catholic. And she had all of the moral purity, all of every the obligatory stuff that the Catholic faith teaches she was doing. Um, truthfully, she was a lost Catholic and I was a lost Baptist. And so, so in our marriage, uh, we uh, decided that we'd 
each go to our churches. And if we ever had kids, we'd raise them, we'd take them to each church. And when they got old enough, let them decide for themselves. Doesn't that sound very woke? Yes. <laughs> no. So there was woke in the, in the uh, early seventies. And uh, uh, we didn't know it at the time, but what we had done, we'd set ourselves on a course to raise pagans. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, uh, we came to the Lord before we had children, and I, I was saved on a Sunday morning. I'll never forget that. Uh, I will show you the power of the gospel. The pastor of our church left many years later because of sexual sin that had been a historic pattern in his life. He preached that morning and the Holy Spirit convicted me and I went forward. He preached the truth. And I thank God for that. But it wasn't about the preacher. It was about the gospel. Yeah. And that's where we all ought to be. And we never get away from the gospel. And so that particular morning, I filled out my decision card I guessed at my church membership because I joined the church and I guessed right. And it was between one of the two churches and I guessed right. <laughs> but that was the less important thing. The most important thing I did is I sat there as a young man in August of 1970 and I wrote on my decision card, I want Jesus Christ to have full control of my life. I give my life to him. It was a few years later when I was an intern at First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, that I realized that my salvation was that day, not when I was 11. And so um, I submitted to believers baptism. And regardless of what anybody says or teaches or whatever, I believe the scripture teaches believers baptism. You're baptized after you're saved, not infant baptism, not anything else. And my baptism at 11, though very sincere and all of that, I just got wet. And so uh, I, I was rebaptized, and my wife, to go back to that 1970 date, about six months later, she came to Christ, mm -hmm. and she was baptized in our church, and uh, it was in a revival meeting for Cheryl. Sam Cathy was preaching on the second coming, and my goodness, Sam is no longer with us, but I remember him fondly, and, and so our trek then I, I was living in Dayton, Ohio at the time, and I was on the police department. I, I was on the Dayton Police Department for about three years, and God called me to ministry. And we sold everything we had, cashed in our retirement. We put what we kept in the U-Haul, and we moved after a number of college tries to see, does God want us here? Does God want us there? We wound up at Southwest Baptist University in Bolivar, Missouri. Now, I'd never been to Missouri. I didn't know anything about it, but that school was recommended. We checked it out, and it just seemed to be where God wanted us. And there, I met Roy Fish. Uh, I was on the Spiritual Life Committee. We scheduled the revival meeting in the Christian Conclave in the spring, and we had Roy come and preach. And uh, I was actually, at that time, headed to Southern Seminary which I did not know, but in Southern Baptist life at that particular time, Southern was a very liberal seminary. And I had no idea about conservative, liberal. I just believed the Bible was the word of God. But when I met Roy Fish, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, I want you to study from this man. Learn all you can. And he helped me transition. And within a month, I was on my way to Southwestern. Baptist Theological Seminary. I have two degrees from that seminary. And uh, our trek took us to the seminary, to a pastor at a wonderful church, Calvary Baptist Church, Hamilton, Texas. And then uh, from there, 14 years on five continents and itinerant evangelism, and 25 years with the two state conventions in Texas. I was Associate Director of Evangelism at the Baptist General Convention of Texas, and then directed prayer and spiritual development uh, for a few years. And I was there from late 92 to 2005, the end of 05, and uh, a three-year hiatus in which I finished some unfinished work in my doctorate and uh, did itinerant ministry, and then began with the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention uh, in uh, uh, 09, January of 09, and then in 2013, uh, became a part of the pastor 
church relations department. That's what it was called then. I don't know what it's called now uh, because denominational stuff changes, names changes. And we left there and uh, in 2020. Uh, Cheryl and I prayed and we felt like there was a lot of transitioning. There was a lot of things that had to happen. There was a lot of things happening. And as we began to pray, I just knew it's your time. You need to get out. I'm, I'm, I'm finished with this, this chapter. So I took in my resignation. I don't want to throw stones or anything like that over my back. I, I have no reason to, but uh, it was God's plan for us to go another direction. And so I was teaching prayer seminars. I've written a lot of material on prayer for local churches and doing those kinds of things. And then in December, uh, I get a call from uh, one of the gentlemen at Calvary Baptist Church, Harlingen. I'd preached in this church about three years earlier when they were without a pastor. And so they had called a pastor. Now they're without a pastor again. And his question was, can you help with an interim? I said, well, I, I can do it. I do that. Um, I'm no longer with the convention. I can put you in touch with them if you want to talk to them. No, we, we want to talk to you. Let's see what this would be like. So these sweet, gracious people engaged us as interim. And uh, in that process, uh, the search committee, one day I was working with them and one of the gentlemen said, uh, is there any reason we can't talk to you about being an interim? And I said, no. I said, here's what we typically teach. And I said, if you feel God's in this and I feel God's in this, then I need to step back, let you all discuss this, let you have freedom, and uh, we'll see what happens. And so uh, we did that. And uh, they prayed. They came back to us. Shell and I prayed. And I believe with everything in me that God sent us in latter years when churches usually don't call people pastor's my age, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but you can see from the screen, I'm not 40. Yeah. Um, they uh, uh, they called us as pastor, 97.3% vote, and uh, we have been here since the, the actual date was July 1st, 2021. So technically, we've been here two years. Realistically, we've been here over two and a half, and uh, I love this congregation, and they keep saying, now, we're in the valley, we're in Harlingen, you know, you're leaving DFW, that's a big mega center, your family and everything like that, so what do you think? And I've been around the state of Texas and around the globe long enough to know it isn't the geographical location, it's the people, and uh, these are some of the dearest and most wonderful people that we have ever walked with in our life, so we thank God for the privilege of being here, and uh, we're here until they decide they don't want us, or God says, I'm through with you, you know, otherwise, we're planted. Well, if, Ted, if I can ask you, you, you've kind of had an advantage as far as when you came as a pastor, because you'd been there, you already had a feel and, and, and some background on the people. Can you, can you kind of help, because mo a lot of times when a pastor comes in, he has no idea. It's kind of like when somebody's looking for a pastor, when I look at a video or I, or I check a resume, it's always the sugar stick. It's always milk and honey. And uh, so when you got there and you began to, to work, uh, something prompted you to, to begin to say, okay, we need to, we need to start this process of transformation. Uh, again, not dirty laundry or anything like that, but what did you, what did you, what kind of prompted the sense of you developing or coming to the place that the Lord led you to, to start what you're calling a transformation? Uh, what well, did you find the, when you got to Harlingen? Yeah, primarily the search committee. Uh, in, in talking with them, uh, they said we need leadership. Now, if you go to um, the site that Lifeway keeps on all the church statistics and everything like that, uh, you'll go back and find there was a significant stretch in the history of Calvary Baptist Church where they only baptized one person. And uh, in the process of that, 
my predecessors, whom I do not want to throw under the bus because every one of us have our strengths and our weaknesses. Every pastor has that. None of us are all things to all people. We're just impossible. And God has seasons and he'll put a person, he'll put a man, uh, I believe in male pastors, uh, he'll put a man in a church for a season and use his gifts. And we're all, trend, we're all interims. If I were to stay here 25 years, that 26th year, I'm gone. We're all interims. It's just a matter of time. And so um, during that space and talking with the search committee, uh, my immediate predecessor uh, had stayed two years. And prior to him was a gentleman that they very much loved who had been here 10 years. But he, in his uh, early 40s, he, he was a, a major type one diabetic. And he had to leave for physical reasons in order to it was stay here and die or go take care of yourself. And they had children and, and he prayed about it. He was a man of God and the church loved him. And so he stepped aside, moved back home. And fortunately, his family had the resources he could do that. Uh, the next pastor, uh, let me just simply say, I don't think that the church and he were ever on the same page. And, and so the church has a school that is also an independent school, an independent organization, Calvary Christian School. It's a wonderful school. I mean, it really is. And uh, there's a lot of tensions. The number one tension is space because you got the school housed in the church. The church needs Sunday school space. The school needs space. You can't take uh, a four-year-old classroom and convert it into an adult classroom on Saturday. That, it, just too much of that. So the problems that are there are actually good problems, normal problems. There's no heretics or anything like that. And uh, But they said, we need leadership. We need leadership. Your age is not a factor. Hmm. And that was the young people on the committee that said that your age is not a factor. And so as I began to pray as an entrant, I always pray, whatever I, church I go to, I always pray for God to expose that which is hindering the flow of his kingdom. Yes, sir. And in that prayer, it can sometimes be painful. If a pastor tries to deal with issues that he sees by himself, he will be the one leaving. Yeah. He will be the one that is out because you have to remember that every church that you go to, it doesn't matter for what reason, revival, pastor, preach one Sunday, whatever it is, those people have lived and worked in that community and gone to school together in that community, and they have relationships with one another. And those relationships will live beyond the tenure of any pastor. Yes. And so if God raises something to the surface, then the whole congregation looks at it. And there's enough, there's enough tipping point of godly people in any of our churches. I would say almost any of our churches where they will look at that and they'll say, Ooh, we got to do something about this. But if you as a pastor try to do it yourself, for most of you, it'll cost you your job. Yeah. And and so uh, time is crucial. You can't do everything in one day. Timing is crucial. And I have watched God since I have been here in his timing do things. And patience is hard for me. I, I, I sometimes think, you know, a benevolent dictator is a really efficient way of leadership, but it's not a biblical sense of leadership. Yes. And uh, you have to shepherd all of the people. We watch for their souls. That's the important thing. And so sometimes you have to leave the time and timing to God and be, be patient. And uh, uh, the concept of transformation, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, and uh, I know that I'll get my brains beat out from the conventions and things like that. But the concept of revitalization is dead in street in my understanding of Scripture. Why do you want to re something that's wrong? Right. Uh, you know, it, it's... Uh, we talk about revival, and we've talked about revival my entire ministry. I've been a revivalist, but we've never had one. Because revival for us is often defined in the old-time religion. Well, that was wonderful for that day and age. 
And yet we're in a different age. I mean, I've got my cell phone, you've got your cell phone, but this little instrument right here is where younger generation is getting all of their information. And there's some bad stuff on this little instrument as well as the usefulness that we can do. And so transformation is a matter of the heart and it transforms the heart and it's the command of scripture. There's nowhere in scripture that it says, be re this. Right. But Paul said in Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you have to have a different mindset. It takes time for people to change. It takes time for me as a pastor to learn the culture in which I serve. So I see myself as a missionary. I'm in an entirely different culture. Now, I know the language. Most 85% uh, of the population of the city is Hispanic, and we've got wonderful Hispanic people in our church, and that's just this area. I don't know Tex-Mex. I don't even know Spanish. I, I, the way uh, we do that and the Spanish from the Argentines, and the, I don't. I, I know English. And most of the Spanish-speaking people know English. A lot of Hispanic people do not know Spanish. So what I've had to do is I've had to learn the culture. And that's still a learning process with me. I've had to learn the culture of this church. I've had to learn how people think. And whether I agree or disagree or something like that, I need to give them respect. And if we're going to be transformed by the renewing of the mind, the mind has to be filled with God's word. It doesn't matter uh, people's preferences. Uh, we're trying to bring transformation by getting back to the word of God. Now, we all say we believe the Bible, and that's great, and that's good, but how much of it do we practice? And so the church uh, had been for a number of years fairly inward focused. That's the reputation in the community. But there is a vision and there is a significant number of our people that while they long for the good old days, and, and these are folks in their 80s, I mean, late 70s, 80s, something like that, they remember better days. And you know something, Dennis? I do too. Sure. Yes. I had my choice. If I could do what I've always wanted to do that God's never let me do. I would stand. Uh, I'm not a King James only. I don't preach from the King James, but I love that language. Yes. I would stand with a suit and tie in a crusade and somebody a la Cliff Barra's type, those old crusade songs, and I would preach evangelistically every service. Yeah. But those that era is gone. When Mr. Graham was doing those crusades, we were trying to model them in our local churches every Sunday morning. And good things happened. But then along comes generations that we send to camp and they're doing their youth style of music. Now those people are adults and they want that in the church and they're doing that. They're doing in their generation what we did in ours. Sure. It's not yeah. long. It's just different. It's different. And, and uh, so I got to roll with those differences, but pour the word of God into everybody the same. And, and so it's not about preference. It's about transformation of the heart. And it begins with renewing your thinking process. Yeah. yeah. Can I just, I don't want to interrupt your thought, but you, you mentioned time and timing. Then yes. you mentioned uh, Romans 12. Uh, right. Read, that metamorpho, the transformation. Um, I love the illustration of the caterpillar in the cocoon. Exactly. Coming out of the butterfly at the end. But I but I, I honestly, sometimes when I preach on that, I always go back and tell those folks, especially the, the pastor who's trying to help pursue that. If you go into that cocoon and cut it open halfway through the process, What's in there still looks more like a caterpillar than it does the butterfly. So I, I have to give the timing for it, that transformation to happen. And I have to be faithful in that. So, so when I look at you and, and I think, my goodness, are you ever going to become a butterfly? That, that the process is there, uh, but it is. And, and so I think you're right. The timing for that, 
give it the time to do that, the patience to do that as the, as the shepherd, um, to, to be willing to, uh, you, you know, me trying to force that process doesn't work. Me commanding that process doesn't work, being frustrated with the process. But just to know that God's at work, that the tune reminds me there is a process. Uh, but it's if, you, if, you, if you cut into that cocoon prematurely, you kill it. That's right. That's you right. Kill it. Yeah. And uh, we've had things a as a result of, of praying. And I mean, it, it's a struggle. None of us are perfect. Uh, we're, leaders are going to make mistakes. We've been going through Nehemiah. Uh, on uh, Wednesday nights, I've been teaching through Nehemiah, and I took an approach to where the first part of our uh, sessions that we would go sort of verse by verse in big chunks, mostly contextual chunks of exposition of the book of Nehemiah, and then we've come back for the last six weeks of the study to look at uh, the themes that go through Nehemiah. There's a leadership theme, prayer theme. Last night, we dealt with problems. How did Nehemiah deal with problems and things of that nature? And so that's all a part of it, but to get back to the time and timing, time is in God's hand. Yeah. Now, I'm impatient. I, I want it now. I mean, I've been the rest of my life doing this. I don't have as much left as I've had. And, and, you know, you do reach that tipping point to where for many years in our life, we realize the end is nearer than it was and we can't go back. So time frustrates me. But in God's, the, God sees the end from the beginning. He is a timeless God. There's no problem to him. I am is who he told Moses he was, yeah. Yeah. You, you know? And so timing is my responsibility to pray and to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit when God says, do this now, don't do this, hold up on this, whatever. And I think in our church, a lot of the really significant changes, if you please, that have been made, we don't try to shift the furniture on the deck of, of the Titanic. We just don't try to shift furniture. We try to follow the Lord, and uh, we we seek that. We've got deacons who do not consider themselves a board. They consider themselves a ministry, and they serve, and they're very helpful. I thank God for these, and they've been deacons a long time. And so we're bringing in some younger guys. We're in process of that now. But uh, one of the significant changes we made uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful music director. And this lady was very professional. Her dad had been a pastor um, and he was deceased. And she's educated at one of our Baptist colleges and taught music in school for years. Well, it was a predecessor that asked her to take this role at the church. Very professional in everything she did, mostly traditional, mm -hmm. things like that. And uh, the choir was basically a senior adult choir. The younger people didn't want to have any, that's not their style. They didn't do that. Well, she became ill and, and an illness that she'd battled with for a long time. In fact, she's just recently recovering from some things and she, she resigned. And so there was no forcing out or anything like that. She resigned and uh, our personnel committee met. And one of the guys said, well, what about these guys? That's the guys we've got now. Let's bring them in, look at it as interim. And we had last year, I'll be honest with you, we had some rocky roads. And there were some folks that they, they're not going to do this. It's rock music. And we don't do rock music. Just about two-thirds of what we sing is right out of the hymn book. All right. Right. And and uh, we just do a different style, but we brought our youth in. So we've got young people on the stage. We, we've got a young lady in the church that's a senior in high school that has a, I mean, a knockout voice. She is good. And she sings in the high school choir and soloist and plays tennis. You got two young guys, three young guys now playing rhythm guitar. We've got a whole family that does strings. We've got a, a lady in our church that's a doctor and her two sons. One of them's a pianist. He's in college studying music. I mean, it's a whole different look and a whole different thing. And our church just loves it. Yes. Had I tried to make that transition myself, it would have destroyed the church. Sure, sure. 
But as it happened through a natural process, our senior adults, by and large, would shake their head and say to me, oh, pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I prefer the old style, but I know that we need to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's been the attitude of our church. And that's the transfer. That's the transformation process. That's the transformation <laughs> process. God did <laughs> in their heart. Sure, sure, sure. And we presented the opportunity. And I, uh, I do things. You know, this is really crazy. I, it, it really is. We had a pulpit. You know, a, a cross. Well, we've got a nice cross in the baptistry, and with my eyes, that upward beam was right in my peripheral vision. Mm. I could see over it, but it was right there. And uh, so I decided I had some back issues in the early 2000s and it developed into drop foot, got a bad diagnosis, never got that treated accurately. So I, I struggle with drop foot and uh, walking. I've got to be careful or I'll stunt my toe and be on the floor. And so we took that cross out and I just got a stool and sat on a stool one Sunday and preached from that stool. I, I honestly, at that time, had no idea I'm changing stuff. Our stage is in disrepair and we're starting in a, another week to repair the stage and things of that nature. But the carpet was just like the, uh, you know, the island. You look at the ocean, the waves yeah. come in and... and and the carpet is 15 years old. I mean, and with the Christian school, our building, we're good stewards of our building. It's used at least six days a week and sometimes seven. And so that's a good thing. But you wear carpets out doing that much work. Um, we got in that. And uh, the first Sunday I did that, I had young and old come to me. I had our senior adult ladies come to me and say, I hope you'll do this often. I feel like you're in my living room talking to me. And so while we did get another pulpit for funerals and things of that nature, and it's back in the storage room and we'll trot it out at the appropriate times, I, I sit on a chair and uh, put my Bible in notes on a little table and talk to the congregation every Sunday morning. And I preach exposition. Yeah. We're in Romans right now. And I, I see those things happening that are transformation. They're not preference. Yeah. yeah. Hearts are getting right. Hearts are deciding this is important. That's not. Now, there was a whole lot of that before I got there. This was a good church. You yeah. know, th this church was not ready to close the doors by any stretch of the imagination. But it has been historically a more traditional, more conservative church. And in the founding, they had a pastor that uh, one of the ladies in the church who was led to the Lord by this pastor uh, said that he was the Billy Graham of the Valley, apparently a great evangelist. Sure. And he pastored this church for 15 years. And some of the older ones will remember. I've got one senior adult that uh, he's struggling with dementia right now. But every time I talk to him, he'll say, have I told you when I was saved? Yeah. Uh, I know some folks struggling with dementia and they start cussing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you see where his heart has been all these years. Yeah. Talk about his salvation experience. And so there was a foundation to begin with. And the Holy Spirit is dealing and working and transforming lives, transforming our church. And uh, I mean, worship is good. <clears throat> Fellowship is good. And we're not perfect, but. Yeah, that's where we are. Yeah. Well, and and so I want to one of the one of the opportunities that I had um after I left the church that I'd pastored for 24 years was to be a transitional pastor at a church that was almost dead. Uh, but they partnered with and merged with a, a very strong, very young uh church in Houston to become a second campus. Um <clears throat> the the process ultimately was and it i think it was intended but it, it the heart was not t 
to, to, to destroy what was there. But the goal ultimately became to take everything that was there and to basically get rid of it and replant a new church there. Um, the difference in what I'm hearing, what you're saying and versus some of those kinds of concepts, because again, you can't, you can't, something that's dead can't be revived. Um, but the truth is what I see different between transformation and quote unquote revitalization or replant is understanding the value of what's there being patient to work in that rather than saying, we've just got to get rid of all this and start over. Um, and, and so, uh, because we became deeply involved with those few folks that were there, the, the 15 or 20 that were still there, the truth is in two years, there were only two of them left because it was a forced, a forced transition rather than a metamorphosis transformation that took place. And I'm, I'm hearing that, that that's the foundational difference between what you see uh, and what I'm seeing in a lot of this, this movement out there today. Yeah, I, I, I've seen that and I have, um, um, let me go back to 2013. I, I was interim pastor of a church uh, in Euless, Texas. It was a small church. It was 52 years old when I went there as interim. Most of the leaders were the widows of the founders. Yeah. 52 years earlier, there were some young people in the church. One young man that is now associate pastor at that church. He was one of the deacons. Phenomenal young man. So I had preached in that church. I knew most of the pastors. I knew the road. Uh, the need of that church was a change in DNA, and they needed a full-time pastor. They were not going to be able to afford a full-time pastor. And so as I began to pray and began to talk to leadership, uh, I felt impressed of the Lord that this church needs to merge with one of our other strong churches in the area. And whatever that merger was, it was, but it had to be the church. So I had I had two churches in mind, and uh, one of them, one of the guys at the convention said, would you like me to put on email to my network and see if anybody's interested? And I did. And he called me after one had turned me down, and they prayed about it for two weeks. And he said, we've already got a project going in Fort Worth, and we can't do both. We just don't have the resources to do both. So I understood that. And I appreciated their praying about it. Turns out that that was totally of the Lord because the guy that responded, the church that responded was First Baptist Church, Keller, Texas. Keith Sanders is a pastor. They were interested in helping. And so we began a process. I mean, it was almost a year process of conversation, of prayer, of talking, our leaders would go to their church, meet with their leaders. Their leaders would come to our church. We would talk. We had open meetings with the people. We'd put things up on board. What are your values? Why? Uh, all of those kinds of things. And I remember the meeting that we were to discuss merging with Keller. Um, one man from the North, um, <clears throat> not that it's bad to be from the North, but he was in an area of very small churches and he was elderly. And he said, I just don't understand merging with another church. We always would just go get a pastor. And we had to do that every two or three years. And, and why don't we just go get a pastor? One of the sweet little ladies stood up and looked at him. I'll never forget her words. She said, brother so-and-so, she said, it was such a wonderful day when you and your family came to our church. We love you. We value you. But she said, my brother, I have to tell you, I've been here from the beginning and we need to do this. Yeah. Well, when we took the vote, there was one abstention. It's 37 to one was the vote. And when Keller came in and this was the DNA change, everything shut down for six weeks they cleaned the building. They, there were some things they just didn't have the money to do, but Keller did. They cleaned the building, changed the name of the church, put a full-time pastor in, 
And Keller's response was not to have a satellite church, but it was going to be their mission, their DNA. So everybody had to join First Baptist Keller. Keller bust people out there. They'd send a van and bring people. And folks went for the first Sunday or two. And then they all started going down the aisle joining First Baptist Keller. Yeah. And so the church reopened with a new name, a new pastor. And for about the next probably six, seven years, uh, they were there. And I got to be a part of the service when First Keller gave back the deed, everything to the property, to the new church. And that church is flourishing and doing well. That was the change in the DNA and a full-time pastor. Sure. With, sure. with Calvary, the DNA is solid. Uh, this church is committed to core biblical theology, to the inerrancy of scriptures and things of that nature. For us, the transformation occurs by coming out of the past into the future and methodology that will reach people today. Not a change in what we believe the Bible teaches, not a change in our core mission. Our purpose statement at the church is we seek to be a great commission church, loving God and loving people. Sure. sure. And we wrap everything around that. Yeah. And making disciples is part of the Great Commission. And we're to go, we're to baptize, and we're to teach them to obey what Jesus taught us. Yeah. Okay. So, everything wrong. Yeah. so how long have you been there now? I have been here uh, since uh, February of uh, 2021, and then since July of 2021 as pastor. Okay. And I, and I know you don't have a crystal ball, <laughs> but if you sitting in your desk today, knowing what you know, where the Lord had, has led you, where, if you could, I don't, I don't want to, I don't even know what word to use, look down the road a little ways. Um, what do you see coming for, for, for the, the, the continuation of that process? Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and trust me, that's been a part of our prayer, part of our conversation. Um, if, if this church were to determine we want to go another direction, I would honor their wishes okay. and we, we'd find some place to go. I doubt very seriously. If we go back to the DFW area, I've lived in the big city long enough and I've lived in the rural areas long enough. And I like, I like small better. Yes. And, yes. And, yes. Uh, you know, especially at this age and it's not a slam on the city, but I, I just don't want to be that busy right now in the traffic and all of that kind of stuff. I like the smaller communities. I really do. It's it's nice to be able to talk to your neighbors yes, and go to church with your neighbors, things of that nature. So there's, that, there's no energy to make any changes or anything like that. We are well-loved and treated well. So that's the church standpoint. My personal standpoint is I don't believe in retirement. I don't believe it's biblical for a man to retire. Now, there are seasons. My season with denominational life is over. I, I served. I served the best I could. It's not a slam on them. It's not anything about me. It's just that season of my ministry is over, and God moved me to a new season. Yeah. Uh, if God moves me to a new season, then we would embrace that. Sure. So uh, I don't have a time frame, but I do have a plan. And what I hope to do is we need to have the right staffing. And so far we do. I'm so proud of our staff members. Uh, we've got a children's director and I've got uh, a director of discipleship, a music director. We stay out of the weeds on these terms that uh, our Southern Baptist Convention are currently fighting over with staff members. And so we just stay out of the weeds and they're directors. Now, eventually, when we get to that point, and that'll mean some growth, then there will probably uh, be on staff an associate pastor. And uh, I, I want someone, but I've already, with our director of discipleship, made plans. If, if anything catastrophic were to happen to me, yeah. this man doesn't feel that God's called him to pastor the church, but he's very much with the vision and has embraced it and believes it. And he could easily step in to a transitional leadership position, uh, easily do that. 
And, and so we've tried to make the plans just in case there's something catastrophic we don't see. But if we get to do the ordinary and God is doing things, we're training leaders, uh, we're, we're working on space so that we can create more Sunday school units. We're looking at small groups and we're getting volunteers that will take everything. I, uh, we don't have a youth director as such. We're looking for a part-time person. We really are. But I have, I believe that historically what we've done in our churches is we have taken the most immature leaders. And these are the young people that are coming out of seminary, out of college or whatever. They are the most immature of our leaders, not any reflection on them, but that's what you are at 25. Yes. You haven't had much experience. And so they're the most immature leaders and we've put them in charge of our most vulnerable age group. The teenage years are tough. And so my commitment, and this church embraced it, is that we're always going to have youth parents leading. We're always going to have parents of youth in there. And we do want someone that is going to learn and going to function and going to grow. And we're committed to helping them. I'm not committed to bringing in staff. I don't care who they are and just drop them in a corner and say, do what you want to do. I'm not going to manage them. Sure. But I'm going to help them get the tools and resources they need to grow and be effective in their ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so well, it's not about. Go ahead. You know, um, not, go ahead. So I'm I'm Pastor John. I'm at a church that's historically in the past 10 years, I've come to realize that we are so caught up in our traditions. And yet the response the, the 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 evidence is that we are we are headed in the wrong direction. Um If I were to, to say to, to, to Dr. Elmore, brother, how, how do I how do I begin to find the ability to, to start the transformation process in my church? Well, number what one, I, first, what do I do first? Well, you 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 take it to the Lord and pray with an open Bible. Okay. Saturate yourselves in the gospels. And look at the book of Acts. Now we have refined our church process through the centuries. And the book of Acts knows nothing about some of these things that we do. And it's not that they're wrong. It's just the church has grown. Um, sure. The properties, you have to be stewards of all that. But if you want to know the essence of Christianity, I, I think you see it. Jesus lays down the principles in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. The book of Acts is how those early apostles who had no Bible to carry under their arm, but they remembered the words of Jesus. They remembered the stories. And they ministered out of that. And then you get the letters where they got in trouble. Even in the first century, they got in trouble. Yes. Yeah. And the apostles were right back and say, what on earth are you thinking? You know, that kind of thing. So I, I would say to anyone, you need to really hear from God. You need to have an open Bible and you need to pray. Once God gives you a vision and a direction, Take your most spiritual leaders, not your positional leaders, because sometimes a positional leader is a spiritual leader. Sometimes a positional leader thinks they're a spiritual leader. Yeah, yeah. And so you get buy-in from your spiritual leaders, and then you talk to your positional leaders. And let the Lord lead you one step at a time. Yes, okay. All right. But you know, you know the vision. You know where you're going. You don't know every step between. Sure. But God has shown you a picture in your spirit of what this church needs to be. The DNA of this church and the methodology to reach this community. And, and, and you get from the, inward focus to outward focus. And the old adage, you, you don't have to throw the baby out with the bath. But from time to time, you have to change the bath water. <laughs> 
you do. I, I firmly believe, and I learned this from a Nigerian brother. I was in Nigeria a number of years ago, and I was speaking at a conference, and, and it was not a Baptist conference. It, it was really non-denominational, but quite charismatic. And they had a fellow that was, preached a sermon on healing that was just plain heresy. You know, that Jesus never asked God to heal anybody. Jesus always commanded the disease. So mm -hmm. you're supposed to command the disease. Yeah. And of course, those uh, folk, they were more charismatic. They were just going nuts. And I went to the leader. I said, hey, I, I said, this guy is unbiblical. Do you want me to say something when I'm preaching? Arrogance on my part. Uh, you know, you learn when you're traveling overseas. Yeah. And this yeah. was a number of years ago. And he looked at me and he said, my brother, he said, we must bring correction without destroying the young man. Yeah. And when he got up and preached that night in the smoothest, kindest way I have ever seen, he brought correction without ever mentioning the young guy. Yeah. Yeah. And that young guy's message just became another message. But this leader, this African leader who knew the people, knew the culture, we must bring correction without destroying the young man. I have always tried to do that, and I'm trying to do that now. Bring correction. Only the Holy Spirit can transform. I can't do that. Yeah. I can set the table. Yeah. And people choose whether they come, but the Holy Spirit brings the transformation but we can bring correction without destroying people because these people that we destroy with all of our current fads and methods, they too are the people of God. They too are saints of God. They are elder brothers and sisters. They are spiritual parents. And we just don't have the right to walk over them. So um, I, I guess, would you say that this is an accurate statement that, one of the differences between transformation and replanting is the transformation process really can't start like it needs to until the relationship with the people are there um, uh, versus, versus just coming in and saying, okay, we're going to build this relationship, but it's going to be after we throw all this out and, 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 and you're going to have to fit our relationship rather than us coming in and learning who you are and getting a vision from God to go forward. Is that a inaccurate state? I, or I, I, I think you're, I think you're in the ballpark and I don't okay. know how to say it better, but I, I do think you have to respect the relationships that are there. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't come in and just destroy all that better to just start a new church. Yeah. Rather than to split that one. I think I, that's my opinion okay. and I could be wrong. I mean, but I, I've, I've advised pastors over the years, especially in a rural area, when you go to a church, get a, get a list of the church members and then go to, go to the cemetery and see how many last names you see. Yeah. Yeah. Those people have lifelong relationships that were there a long time before we ever get there. Yeah. And sometimes you have to walk over that. Sometimes you do. You you have to obey God. But as the generations change and as we change, we have to keep it forefront. As a pastor, we watch for their souls. We don't right. destroy their souls. Right. We watch for their souls. And right. so uh, uh, it, it's... Um, uh, you know, I can't speak for another man. I know how God has wired me and I know what I see from scripture and I've got to obey that. And uh, yes. I, I want uh, all of these fellows that are into replanting, you know, in, in denominational life with respect to the denomination, all denomination, you don't find anything but the local church in the Bible. Right. Right. Exactly. So, I, I had a fellow sit in my office trying to sell me on their ministry the other day. And I looked at him and I said, what local church are you attending now? And he said, what do you mean local church? And I said, well, there's some sort of semblance of a building usually has a sign outside <laughs> and it's got a street address. Yeah. That's a local church. Yeah. And I found out he wasn't attending. One. Right. Right. And uh, so everything he tried to sell me just went down the drain in that conversation. And I know that 
our heart is to help the church and grow the kingdom because the church is an instrument in the kingdom of God. But uh, it still goes back to God's people. That's right. That's right. Well, Brother Ted, thank you this morning, today, whenever folks are watching this, for being with us. Um, I, I have enjoyed immensely our time. I, I think what you've given us are some great insights. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm not going to say you're old. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> but but, I, but here's, I, I met with a young church planter not long ago who was doing a dynamic work. He was he was 32 and was sharing with him about our ministry, what we do as far as encouraging and supporting and helping pastors. And he just really looked at me with integrity. He said, Why, what, what, what do you bring to the table that I need? If you don't have anything of value, why should I even, you know, listen to you? <laughs> and I, I said, no, I said, sir, I, I do have an answer for you. You're not going to like it, but I do have an answer for you. And and he's kind of smug, smugly said, well, what is your answer? And and I said, sir, I've forgotten more about ministry than you know. You've been doing this 12 years. I've been doing this longer than you've been alive. I don't say that to be arrogant, but I say, I say that to you from experience. You said a while ago, a 25-year-old person, um, until you've walked that road, until you've been the journey that you've been, until you've, 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 you've gone through those things, we need folks that are not old but seasoned to come alongside us and partner with us and help us and encourage us because so many of the guys, even in the network, are those guys who are in those rural churches, who are in those smaller churches, who when you drive down the road, every family in their church has a road named after them. You know, exactly. cemetery is full. And, and just need to be encouraged that that it's not hopeless, it's not helpless, um, that the Lord can still work, the Lord can still transform. Uh, and so having you with us uh, for this segment has been tremendous, 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 and I appreciate uh, your wisdom. Uh, I promise you from time to time we'll we'll have folks reach out and, and maybe see some of this and go, how can I, how can I, how can I get more help, more information on those kinds of things? And if it's okay with you, um, just let me direct them to you. Uh, direct them, put, put my email address out there for them. I'd be, I'd be happy, and we can begin the conversation there. Um, I, I will say this that I had not said, but based on what you said, I have sat down one-on-one -on -one with a lot of our senior adults, and I said, tell me your story. Yes. When you were said, Brother, I'm telling you, that's refreshing to this pastor. Yes. My gentleman I talked about just a few moments ago, um, and everybody from Harlan listens to this will know who he is, but he's 91 years old and he's struggling and uh, has, has been unbelievable servant of God. Uh, in any way you want to name, uh, this man has been that. And he sat in his office one day and he said have I ever told you my story and I said no but I want to hear it and he said I was raised and he named the denomination he said nobody ever talked to me about being saved hmm. nobody I didn't know what it was he said I was an adult businessman in this town and he mentioned this pastor's name he said he came by now this pastor pastored in the 50s he pastored Calvary a little bit, went to World War II, came back, pastored the church for about 15 years, from 1950 to about 1965. I'm guessing at the dates, but it's 15 years. That pastor walked in, looked at him, called his name, and he said, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been saved? Well, in the 50s, everybody in the South knew what that word meant. Yes. I mean, my hometown, lost and saved alike, knew what that word meant. And uh, he looked at him and said, well, I don't know that I have. And he said, can you come by my office about two o'clock this afternoon? And the businessman said, I can. Went to the pastor's office and the pastor took his New Testament and led him to Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what that man has given to the cause of Christ over the years in both time, in service, in money, in every area is absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. And great will be his reward in heaven. Yeah. And 
I, I say that just to go back and and to affirm that these are people with stories. Our problem today, Dennis, in my opinion, is that we are trying to revive the church in an unrevived generation. And by generation, I don't mean a certain age group. I mean a period of time. Yes. Yeah. Only the spirit can do that. So every time we see a college prayer meeting where something has happened, we all run with our cameras and get there and everybody wants to talk about it, the recent happenings at Asbury. And I'm not criticizing that whatsoever. I'm not. But all of a sudden, you saw it go high and you saw all these revivalists and all these prayer leaders. We need to do this. We need to do that. That's all dead now, except for those kids on that campus that God touched their heart. Yeah. And so by and large, across the nation, we're in an unrevived generation trying to revive the church through means yeah. and only the Holy spirit can do that. Yeah. 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 Well, again, my friend, it's always a pleasure to spend time with you. Um, Thank you. And we, we will get this ready and get it posted as quick as we can, but guys, thank you for being with us, watching this today. And uh, this will conclude our section on uh, conversation with pastors on transformation, not simply revitalization.